I'm Jesse Ventura. Stay vigilant and question more. Welcome to my world. Come along for the ride. The world according, according to Jesse. To Jesse. Jesse. Today, we discuss congressional efforts to gut Social Security and Medicare and emerging details about the government's UFO program. Sit tight. The show starts now. The world according to Jesse. 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 Hi, I'm Brigitte Santos. For our top story today, the Senate has introduced its next proposed coronavirus stimulus package. The HEALS Act draft includes another one-time stimulus check providing up to $1,200 in aid to qualifying Americans and pledges over $100 billion to school reopening. The Senate bill also slashes enhanced unemployment benefits from $600 per week to $200 until October, when the federal boost will then reportedly be replaced with a system to recover 70 percent of workers' wages. But as the Democrats and Republicans fight over what to include in the latest stimulus package, 30 million Americans remain unemployed and the moratorium has expired on rental evictions that were implemented under the CARES Act. A new eviction estimation tool based on census responses predicts that over 17 million households are currently unable to pay rent, nearly 12 million of which could be evicted over the next four months. Jesse, what do you want to see in the next stimulus package? Because the last one left a lot of people hanging. Well, Brigida, let's get into that a moment. First of all, we got to go to the system. You have a system, and I've said this before, based upon bribery. How much money entities give to the Republican Party, how much money entities give to the Democratic Party, and then how much they give to each individual candidate. So it's a system of bribery. So when something like this comes up, the people that pay them their money are going to be the first ones restored. They're going to be the ones taken care of. In other words, the rich people. They will get taken care of. And that we're still under some sort of influence that there'll be a trickle-down effect, that if we give all the money to the wealthy people, eventually it'll trickle down to the poor people. Well, everything's in trouble now because you got people out there that are frightened of things like Social Security and, and things of that nature. And you got to understand something. Spending stimulates the economy. So if they cut back on giving people money, the economy's going to suffer because the people won't be able to go out and spend that money. So the economy will stop. Spending is the gasoline that fuels the economic engine. We better wake up to that fact and taking money away from the people who are going to spend it will kill the economy, not enhance it. Now, also included in the HEALS Act draft is legislation sponsored by Senator Mitt Romney to, quote, strengthen America's endangered federal trust programs, which he claims will run out of money due to government spending during the pandemic. Now, experts are skeptical that the trust program will be strengthened by this plan because Romney has long sought to gut Social Security and Medicare. If the Trust Act passes, reforms could result in future generations losing sufficient Social Security and Medicare benefits. Jesse, imagine for a minute what the U.S. will look like when people in their 60s can no longer rely on Social Security and Medicare, especially people like me who have already, you know, graduated during 2008 in the last economic downturn. Well, you got to remember, Brigida, this is socialism and we're scared to death of it. You see people hold their <gasps> socialism. We can't have that here. They need to understand Social Security is socialism, Medicare is socialism, and the United States military is complete socialism. People need to learn. In a capitalist society, you have to have socialism working hand in hand with the capitalism and find the proper balance to both, which lifts everybody up and then everybody does better. You must have some socialism. And I'll tell you this, I, uh, if, if this is true and they gut Social Security and Medicare, then the United States of America will have no middle class anymore by any stretch of the imagination. We will then become a third world nation with only rich and poor. 
The Trust Act was previously endorsed by at least 30 House Democrats and, of course, dozens of Republicans. Both parties find ways to rein in the national debt by gutting social programs that help essential workers, seniors, and the unemployed, while boosting socialist programs that help the wealthiest Americans, like the Trump administration's proposed payroll tax cut, which they are considering putting in this Heals Act. Well, and also, let's talk about something else that's in there, this brand new FBI building that he wants. Now, why should the FBI, what's the matter with the building they're in? What do they need a new one for at a time like this, when people out there are going check to check if they've even got a check? And yet, and here's what I heard the reason is, they were going to be, this has been in the plans for a couple of years, they were going to build it in another area, but now President Trump wants it rebuilt right where it's at. You know why? Because if it doesn't happen there, a hotel's going to go in there, which is going to cause his hotel to have competition. He doesn't want no competition. That's why he put this in the bill to build a new FBI office so his hotel won't have any competition. And I'm sure Mitch McConnell will rubber stamp that, as he always does. In other news, the Pentagon has announced plans to reveal new details about the government's once-secret UFO program. The Pentagon previously claimed the program was defunct, but recent Senate committee reports confirm that people are still working on the Unidentified Aerial Phenomenon Task Force. Government officials say the main goal of the program is to find out whether other countries have breakout aviation technology that could threaten the United States, but it also reportedly seeks answers about life beyond Earth. Now, over the next few months, the Director of National Intelligence will publicly disclose some of the Pentagon's findings on unidentified aerial phenomena. So far, Jesse, government officials are pointing fingers at the aerial capabilities of Russia and China more than they are at possible extraterrestrial threats. Since space is obviously another theater for the new Cold War, I wouldn't be surprised to hear WMD-level claims about what our so-called adversaries are doing in space. Would you? No doubt about it. I mean, President Trump has already started a space force, so he's going to send military up there. And you're going to see militarization of space because that supports the military industrial complex, which is hugely powerful and needs support to keep jobs growing in our militaristic country that must have a war at all times, even if it's just a cold war. We still need cold and hot wars going at all times. The burner's got to be on on that. It's a shame. But I'll tell you this. Maybe they can make a deal, Brigida. Maybe here on Earth we can make a deal that all wars will be fought in outer space. That might be a good thing. Take it to space, fight it up there, and that way not one bomb would have to go off on the planet Earth. We could do all the fighting up in space. Do you think maybe that's what they got in mind? I doubt it. We now turn to the health sector where a new autopsy study of COVID-19 patients out of NYU confirms that the disease can cause widespread blood clotting. Now, this comes as a growing number of coronavirus patients under 40 years old suffer from strokes and blood clots. Some patients did not have underlying medical conditions or other symptoms associated with the virus. A pathologist involved in the autopsy study says clotting was found in almost every organ researchers looked at. As we previously reported on the show, health experts now believe COVID-19 is a vascular disease and respiratory illness. In rare cases, the virus also triggers a life-threatening inflammatory syndrome in children that causes cardiovascular shock, fever, and hyperinflammation. A study by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention shows that 73% of children who suffered from multi-system inflammatory syndrome were previously healthy. At least 70% of those subjects did test positive for SARS-CoV-2, so there is a link. Jesse, doctors and scientists continue to warn us about all the immediate and long-term health consequences of the virus, yet people keep risking their lives. Do you think this is partially because so many Americans already lack decent health care? Are we just used to dying unnecessarily and people are just giving up? No, I don't think it's that at all. I think it's arrogance. I think it's people in this country think somehow they have freedom. I wish people would go to my website, and I don't say that often where I discuss this, because I'll tell you what, if masks don't help, 
then why do they wear them? My mom had to wear one six to eight hours a day. Why? Because she was a nurse in surgery. If masks don't help, why do they wear them in surgery? To control germs. It's that simple, people. Next time, when people have surgery and they don't believe in masks and taking the preparation, tell the doctors and nurses they don't have to wear them while they operate on you. See how that works out for you. And I'll tell you what, we're going to end up like a third world nation because we are pampered. We are not willing to sacrifice like our parents did in World War II. That's the biggest problem here. You got an ego problem in America. Look at the rest of the world. They're wearing masks and they're defeating this thing. We're the worst at it because we got an ego in the way. It's time for a break. When we return, Jesse sits down with author Simon Anholt to talk about the importance of international cooperation when it comes to solving the world's biggest problems. We'll be right back. The world according to Jesse. Jesse, Jesse. The world according to Jesse. Jesse, Jesse. Simon Anholt founded the Good Country Project to help nations work together on global challenges like climate change and poverty. He joins me now from London to talk about his new book, The Good Country Equation, How We Can Repair the World in One Generation. Wow. Simon, the Good Country Index is the annual survey that ranks countries on their contribution to humanity and the planet. Where does the United States stand on this list? Well, Jesse, the U.S. ranked 40th place in the last edition. 40th. It's pretty much a tie with Russia, which ranked 41st. Yeah. Wow, 40th? That's, that's out of 150-odd countries, so it's not... Yeah, out of 150, it's not so very bad. Well, I don't know. We're a country that likes to be number one and to be 40th. That You don't tell people here you want to be 40th. Anyway, what countries have made the top 10? And can you give us some examples of what they're doing? Well, the countries that are in the top 10 are all from Europe. And in fact, all but one of them, Switzerland, are in the European Union. And of course, I get a lot of angry emails from uh, from people all over the world saying it's just because you're in Europe. Well, I'm not in Europe anymore. We left and they're still top, <laughs> at, uh, top of, the, of the index. It's basically because within Europe, uh, the member states of the European Union have a long habit of cooperation and collaboration together, and they've seen the benefits of it. And that's why they keep on doing it. They work together all the time and it works for them. Now, for the past 20 years, you've advised leaders all over the globe on many issues. Why do they come to you and what expertise do you give them? Well, you know, in the first place, 20 years ago or so, they started coming to me because I was a specialist in a very, very narrow area. I was a specialist in national image, whether your country is well regarded by the world's population or not. And governments most of the time came to me because they wanted advice on how they could improve the image of their country because they'd figured out, they'd discovered that this tied directly into prosperity. If a country has a good image, you get all the tourists you want, all the investment you want, all the talent you want. But if you're an unknown country or you're a country with a negative image, it's all difficult. And that was where it started. Now, your work seems to be centered around encouraging international cooperation. How is international cooperation different from capitalistic notion of globalization? Well, I think the capitalistic notion of globalization is basically about trade, isn't it? It's about opening countries, especially developing countries' markets to producers all over the world. And in itself, that isn't such a bad idea, except that over the last 20, 30, 40, 50 years, the benefits of that globalization have been spread, I think we can all agree, very unequally indeed. But what I'm talking about here is not trade. I'm not talking about a new form of globalization. What I'm talking about is the fact that humanity is facing some gigantic challenges from climate change to poverty to low standards of education to conflict to pandemics. And we're only going to fix those challenges unless we work together. And we don't work together nearly enough. So what the good country uh, philosophy is all about is giving countries good reasons to work together not asking them to do it for, 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 for charitable reasons, 
but because it will produce better results for everybody. Now, how does international cooperation generate goodwill worldwide? And what are some examples of this? Well, this is one of the interesting things that, that uh, I run a big survey called the Nation Brands Index, which I've been running back uh, since, since back in 2005. And uh, it's collected over a billion data points of polling data, just asking ordinary people all around the world in dozens of countries how they perceive other countries. And back in 2012, I decided that I wanted to ask this big database, why is it that people admire some countries more than others? Wh which are the countries that people admire and why? And basically what the analysis told me is that people admire good countries, by which they mean they admire the countries that contribute something to the world that they live in, outside their own borders. So if I live in Kenya, I don't especially care what, say, India does for its own citizens or Canada does for its own citizens, but I do care whether India or Canada contribute something to the world in which I live and in which my children are going to grow up in. So it turns out the number one driver of a positive image for a country is the perception that that country contributes something to the international domain, to the planet and to the rest of humanity. So that's basically the, the discovery. The more good you do, the better you perform because people like you. Now, we're in the midst of a global pandemic. In your opinion, is the international community cooperating successfully on this front? Well, well what do you think? I mean, the international community hasn't shown itself in the possible light during the pandemic, has it? And in a way, what it's done is it's revealed to us the sad truth that when the chips are down and things start getting really difficult, what countries tend to do is they tend to batten down the hatches, look inwards and look after their own, not even necessarily their own citizens, but their own special interest groups, their own businesses and all the rest of it. Having said that, I don't want to be too pessimistic about it. Uh, we are, for example, making advances in the uh, scientific analysis of, the, of the, the, the COVID virus. We're making great advances in terms of developing vaccines. And all of that is partly because scientific cooperation between countries is still good. It's still there. It's still strong. So I wouldn't want to say there's no cooperation and no collaboration. We could use a whole lot more than there is. So I'd give us a kind of five out of 10 right now. Okay, now do you think the United Nations is effective in bringing countries together as we're led to believe it is? Well, it's the best thing we've got. I mean, there's no doubt is there that if you were designing the UN today, this is a very different world from the world that the UN was originally created for. And I think you'd design it in a very different way. It would look very different. But that's just idle talk, because even if you and I did sit down for 20 minutes and design a better UN, which I'm sure we could do, and it would be great fun, we don't have the authority. Nobody has the authority to impose that. So I think that the parts of the United Nations that are trying to uh, combat poverty and inequality the United Nations Development Program, all of the parts of the UN that, 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 that help the, the developing world, they're great. And we would not want to be without them because they do so much good. The Security Council and the General Assembly, the parts that act more like a sort of world government, no, it doesn't work. It's not fair and it needs adjusting. And I think we will change it. I think it will change itself. It's trying to change all the time. So again, maybe seven out of 10 for the development parts of the United Nations and three to four for the parts that uh, are supposed to create uh, new policies together. Now, you've stated the world's biggest problems from poverty to climate change can be solved if countries collaborate with one another rather than competing with one another. Yeah, the fact of the matter is that I, I, I don't have a problem with competition. That would be stupid. Competition is a wonderful thing. It's part of human nature. Competition between countries has lifted billions of people out of poverty. Competition only becomes a problem when it's the only altar at which we worship. And that's basically been the story of the global system for the last 80 years or so. If you're wise, you learn how to mix and to harmonize competition and collaboration. You can compete, but you can also work together. And that's the little lesson that humanity needs to learn today. We need to learn how to collaborate, 
and cooperate a whole lot more and compete just a tiny bit less. But I'm not talking about self-sacrifice here, Jesse. I'm not saying that the countries should sacrifice themselves for the benefit of other countries. That would be ridiculous. I have no problem whatsoever when President Trump says America first. It's a statement of the obvious. If you're elected to run a country, of course you put the interests of that country first. But what I disagree with is the implication that maybe that means everybody else has to come last. If everybody comes last, then America is going to come last as well. America needs a prosperous, thriving global economy. It needs to work as it has done in the past with the other countries who also want to come first or first equal. So I think what I'm talking about here is a mixture of the two, competition and collaboration. They work well together. And finally, how can we repair the world in one generation? What can we do as individuals to help? Well, what it basically says in the, in, in the book, which is, which is coming out in a couple of weeks, The Good Country Equation, it says there are two things wrong with the world. One is the way that countries behave, which is what you and I have been talking about here. And the other is the way people behave. So it's through our actions and our lack of action that all of the problems in the world have come about. So we need to change the way countries behave and we need to change the way people behave. We can change the way people behave by educating them differently. So what I'm calling for now is a new global compact on educational values. So we bring up a better generation of kids who run towards these challenges instead of running away from them. And we can change the way countries behave by speaking to our governments and saying more collaboration, less competition. Simon, in a world that feels more fractured than ever, thank you for the work that you're doing. Good luck. And I'd love to have you back on the show at another time so that we can, uh, we can uh, see how we're doing and see how this is moving forward. Again, Simon Anhold, thank you very much. Keep up the good work. Thank you, sir. The world according to Jesse. Jesse, Jesse. Let's turn to the viewers. We asked people on social media whether or not they support Romney's Trust Act. Our first user says no, because people need those programs now more than ever. We should be raising taxes on the rich who are making billions while forcing their employees to work in dangerous situations. He continues by saying most Americans don't want to cut these programs. Most Americans want higher taxes for the rich. If we lived in a democracy, that would matter. Jesse? He's exactly correct right now. The breaks are going to the rich people as they always do. But I'll tell you what, they're learning something from this pandemic. They can't survive without us, the regular people. The people are out there doing this work for them. So always remember this, you can rise up and you can protest. And that's what they're trying to stop right now, people, your First Amendment rights. Another user says, no, Social Security should be, could be easily funded and benefits could be increased just by lifting or eliminating the cap. The idea of cutting Social Security is absurd. I agree. I mean, uh, you know, people have to have, as I said earlier, socialism is not a bad thing. You need a certain amount of it to raise up all of society. Social Security, Medicare, and the military. Those are all socialist programs completely. Where would we be without them? And why would we want to change a system that has truly worked pretty well for about 70 or 80 years now, hasn't it? But we're going to change it and privatize it? I don't trust that at all. Not one bit. Thanks for watching. Send us your comments on Facebook and Twitter for a chance to be featured in next week's episode when we cover more stories ignored by the corporate media. And as always, remember, when the government lies, the truth becomes a traitor. Stay vigilant and wear your mask. The world according to Jesse. Jesse. Jesse.